an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such references truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. Friedrich Nietzsche, the great atheist of the last century who proclaimed the death of God, understood that the death of God meant the destruction of all meaning and value in life. I think that Friedrich Nietzsche was right. But we've got to be very careful here. The question here is not, must we believe in God in order to live moral lives? I'm not claiming that we must. Nor is the question, can we recognize objective moral values without believing in God? I think that we can. Rather, the question is, if God does not exist, do objective moral values exist? Like Nietzsche and Rus, I don't see any reason to think that in the absence of God, the morality evolved by Homo sapiens is objective. After all, if there is no God, then what's so special about human beings? They're just accidental byproducts of nature, which have evolved relatively recently on an infinitesimal speck of dust lost somewhere in a hostile and mindless universe in which are doomed to perish individually and collectively in a relatively short time. On the naturalistic view, some actions, say rape, may not be socially advantageous and so in the course of human development has become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is really wrong. On the atheistic view, there's nothing really wrong with your raping someone. Thus, without God, there is no absolute right and wrong which imposes itself on our conscience. But the problem is that objective values do exist, and deep down, I think we all know it. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. Actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just uh, socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. Some things, at least, are really wrong. Similarly, love, equality, and self-sacrifice are really good. But if objective values cannot exist without God, and objective values do exist, then it follows logically and inescapably that God exists. On the basis of these signposts of transcendence, it's reasonable to believe that there exists a creator and designer of the universe who is the ground and source of moral value. Moreover, I think it's reasonable to believe the specifically Christian claim that this God has revealed himself decisively in Jesus Christ. Here I want to share two further signposts. Signpost number four, the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was a remarkable individual. New Testament critics have reached something of a consensus that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, with the authority to stand and speak in God's place. That's why the Jewish authorities instigated his crucifixion on the charge of blasphemy. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus did rise from the dead, then we would have good grounds for believing that he was who he claimed to be. And there are, in fact, three established facts recognized by the majority of New Testament historians today which support the resurrection of Jesus. Let me say a word about each one of these. Fact number one, on the Sunday morning following his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was discovered empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian scholar who has specialized in the resurrection, quote, by far, most scholars hold firmly 
to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb, end quote. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent German New Testament critic Gert Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite their having every predisposition to the contrary. Jews had no belief in a dying, much less a rising Messiah, and Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead before the end of the world. Luke Johnson, a New Testament critic from Emory University, muses, some sort of powerful transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. N.T. Wright, an eminent British scholar, concludes that is why, as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. Finally, signpost number five, the immediate experience of God. You can know that God exists wholly apart from arguments, simply by immediately experiencing him. Now, if this is the case, there's a danger that arguments for God's existence could actually distract your attention from God himself. If you are sincerely seeking God, then God will make his existence evident to you. The Bible promises, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We mustn't so concentrate on the external proofs that we fail to hear the inner voice of God speaking to our own hearts. For those who listen, God becomes an immediate reality in their lives. So, in conclusion, we've not seen any good reasons to think that scientific naturalism is true. Moreover, we have seen five signposts of transcendence which point beyond the universe to its ground in a creator and designer of the universe who is the locus of absolute goodness and has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Together, I think these provide a powerful cumulative case for the truth of the Christian worldview. Thank you, Professor Craig, and we now turn...